They may not be at the top of the mountain in terms of the big animation studios, but Paramount Animation still has plenty of fun bad guys, both big and small throughout their library of movies. But out of all these bad guys, which ones are truly the most chilling and ruthless? I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and this is Paramount Animation Villains, evil to most evil. Now, just so we're all on the same page, for this list, we're gonna be primarily focusing on the villains from Paramount's fully animated movies. We will, however, make a couple of small exceptions for Paramount's most popular hybrid films. With that being said, let's start with our least evil Paramount animation animation villain, Mayor Humdinger from the Paw Patrol movies. For as goofy as this guy typically is, he still manages to be both devious and corrupt through both his role as mayor of Foggy Bottom and his position as leader of the Kitten Catastrophe crew. Now obviously the villain of a show made for preschoolers isn't going to be able to do that much evil. This is humiliating. Hence why he's this low on our list. But in both Paw Patrol movies, he does have the occasional impressive villainous moment. In the first movie, Humdinger uses his henchmen to try and capture the pups by any means necessary. Afterwards, he turns the city subway into a roller coaster. And when that naturally causes a ton of chaos, this so-called mayor just bails, not really caring about the danger he's put his citizens in. He then causes even more danger when he destroys the controls of the cloud chaser, prompting a massive storm. He's even too much of a coward to confess to his crimes, all while claiming that mayors can't be arrested. We only see him as a secondary antagonist in the second movie, but his brief stint as the powered up mega mayor is still enough to show how little Humdinger has changed despite his previous arrest. But while Humdinger was a pretty bad leader, it could be argued that Pikachu from Paws of Fury was even worse. This kitty warlord's main goal is to destroy the village of Kakamuchu. The problem with the good citizens of Kakamuchu is there are too many good citizens in Kakamucho. All for the sake of his own greed and selfish desires. Much like the Mel Brooks character that he's based off of. Really, just the fact that he only wanted to destroy it so he could keep his perfect view from his own village. That hairball of a town is ruining my magnificent view. Speaks to just how heartless this guy is. If this wasn't enough, Ikachu is also willing to punish and enslave dogs and even other cats for the pettiest of reasons. But for as sneaky, manipulative, and murderous as he can be, when push comes to shove, he's also incredibly cowardly. Again, he really only cares about himself to the point where he's not above insulting his minions, even when they're not only doing his dirty work for him, but are also much stronger than he is. So it's safe to say that he's not exactly the smartest cat around. Following him, we have the shark monster wrestler Tentacular from Rumble. Sometimes even when you have it all, you still have a huge chip on your shoulder. And this guy certainly shows that. From the start of the film, Tentacular is introduced as the monster wrestling champion, but even with all his wins, he just can't let go of how often he was compared to Rayburn. And after years of living in his shadow, Tentacular vows to not only defeat Rayburn's son, but also tear down everything that Rayburn built up during his life so that he doesn't have to live in his rival's shadow ever again. I can tear down everything that casts that shadow. While he starts off as your simple rival sports movie level bully, he's able to slowly amp up his maliciousness throughout the film. Despite all she does to help him win his fights, Tentacular is also pretty callous towards Winnie, his coach. Additionally, despite all the support and love that the town of Stoker had shown him up until this point, Tentacular didn't hesitate when he got the opportunity to wrestle for Slitherpool instead. It's all about me. Even though doing so would leave Stoker without a monster to fight in its stadium, causing the town to go bankrupt. This makes his eventually released desire and attempt at tearing down the stadium himself all the more cruel and selfish. Sometimes just being intimidating is enough to fall into the role of a villain, as we saw with Rango's Rattlesnake Jake. Known as both the Grim Reaper and the Serpentine Devil, this weapon-wielding, cold-blooded, literally, outlaw was made famous in the town of Dirt for always taking at least one soul with him each time he leaves. When it comes to his fights, he's both sadistic and manipulative as he enjoys playing with his enemies before he kills them. He's also clever and incredibly perceptive, making it pretty much impossible for the citizens of Dirt to trick him, despite getting pretty close to doing so with their hawk disguise. But while Jake is later revealed to be working with the true villain of the film, he's not exactly the most loyal to his allies. Though funnily enough, Jake is actually shown having a code of honor of sorts, as he'll side with others if they have a common enemy or he legitimately respects or admires someone. Above all else, he absolutely hates liars, to the point of calling Rango out 
out as a liar, even though Rango's lies weren't personally impacting him. He also easily breaks off his alliance with Major John, killing him shortly after John tries to betray him, while at the same time sparing Rango as thanks for saving his life. But even if this technically qualifies as a good deed, given how awful John was, Jake is still a snake with a pretty notorious body count and a cruel nature, so any sense of honor can really only go so far. We finally arrived at the first of our Spongebob movie villains, that being King Poseidon from the third movie. Of all the Paramount villains, it could be argued that Poseidon is the most vain, as all he cares about is keeping his skin looking and feeling silky smooth and without any wrinkles. In order to do this, he captures innocent snails and uses their snail slime until they're unable to produce any more. I hope you don't run out of juice, or you'll end up like the others. After which, he simply throws them in his dungeon. Given that he's driven by vanity, as well as his belief that his skin is more valuable and important than the actual lives of snails, we feel that Poseidon deserves our pride medal. While his evil motivation may be, it can't be denied that Poseidon is a cruel and incredibly selfish leader, easily being worse than both the show and the first movie's version of King Neptune. It should also be noted that anyone who dares to stand up to him, he sentences them to death by stage show, using these executions more as a source of entertainment for himself than actual justice. Really, the only reason why we can't rank him as any more evil on our list is, much like Rattlesnake Jake, the end of the film does show that he's not entirely evil, just, you know, mostly evil. Yeah, him doing the bare minimum of letting SpongeBob Gary and the other snails go after SpongeBob teaches him the power of friendship isn't exactly a super high bar to clear, but compared to some of our upcoming villains, it's still a good deed regardless. And hey, if you thought Poseidon was pretty spoiled, Coco certainly takes her entitlement to a whole new level. As a businesswoman, Coco only cares about getting her next big promotion and is willing to do anything to get it, even if it means lying to an innocent guy like Chaz Finster in order to get herself a husband and a child to show to her boss. Given that she isn't all that interested in dating and seems to absolutely hate kids, this just makes her whole scheme that much harder to watch. As you know, it's going to end in either heartbreak for Chaz or a new terrible home life for Chucky. Speaking of Chucky, it's made clear over and over that Coco could care less about her would-be stepson, to the point of stealing his teddy bear simply because she thinks it's disgusting. She's equally cruel to the other Rugrats, having her assistant essentially kidnap them and keep them locked away so they can't ruin her wedding. Again, these are innocent babies. It takes a special kind of villain to be this mean to literal babies. Even Angelica can't escape her ire, given how she threatened the girl just for eating her fancy chocolates. In the end, it's her ego, her temper, and her unwillingness to be anything less than cold-hearted that does her in. But let's talk about another SpongeBob movie villain, the dastardly Burger Beard. This is another villain to where, while he may be incredibly silly, he also proves to be a big threat when he wants to be. Through finding a magic book, Burger Beard is able to steal the Krabby Patty recipe, not caring about all the chaos and destruction that he throws Bikini Bottom into. Through these selfish actions, as long as he can have his own successful food truck. And he's also pretty mean to his seagulls, threatening to turn them into hot wings. Which one of you? next. Despite them not doing anything to him other than being mildly annoying. Later on, when SpongeBob and the gang eventually confront him, Burger Beard doubles down on his cruelty and uses his magic book to send them to Pelican Island in the hopes of them getting eaten. Though Burger Beard may not be out here trying to take over the entire world, all the trouble he brought to Bikini Bottom really can't be understated. And really, the fact that he chose to try and kill SpongeBob and the others instead of, you know, just making a copy of the recipe so they could both have it, just further emphasizes his selfishness. I mean, it's not like the Krusty Krab would even be a direct competitor for him, given that it's underwater. But hey, at the end of the day, Burger Beard was just a wannabe restaurant owner. If you want a true businessman bad guy, look no further than Sheck from the Hey Arnold movie. Known as the CEO of future tech industries, Sheck tried to tear down Arnold's neighborhood to avenge his family, will be revenge of the sweetest kind, who had been humiliated during the street's famous tomato incident back in colonial times, under the guise of wanting to bring the neighborhood into the future. He's willing to do anything from pushing people out of their homes and businesses to stealing and burning historical documents in order to get what he wants. He's extremely underhanded when it comes to his business deals, and despite the fact that he's fighting a trio of nine-year-olds throughout the movie, he seems to get a special sort of enjoyment out of trying to destroy their hope when it comes to their save-the-neighborhood efforts. Sheck also crosses the line when he tries to cause the bug 
boss that Arnold, Gerald, and Helga are on to crash just for the sake of getting rid of the evidence they have, and then later actually tries to run down Arnold and Gerald, plus a whole bunch of other people, during an escape attempt, which he would have done with a smile on his face if not for Grandma Gertie stealing his tires. Talk about an over-the-top evil, as well as an evil that easily earns our wrath medal as, again, all this is just about getting revenge on a neighborhood for a rebellion that happened decades ago. Entering the upper half of our list, next are the pair of poachers from the Wild Thornberries movie, Sloan and Bree Blackburn. It should be said that the poachers are probably as close to a real-world villain as we're gonna get on this list. And really, you should have expected that any villain who was this cruel to animals was gonna make it pretty far down our ranking. Both Sloan and his wife pretend to be zoologists with a focus on preserving endangered species in order to get closer to these animals and use them for their own gain. While it's implied that these two have captured and killed many animals over the years, their grand plan during the film, using explosives to frighten a herd of over a thousand elephants during their migration, causing them to stampede into an electric fence so that they can kill them and harvest their ivory, really, really takes the cake. This one plan alone earns him our greed medal, as you have to be pretty damn greedy to try and kill over a thousand elephants in one shot. What's worse, and perhaps even more terrifying, is Sloane's temper and willingness to kill anyone, even children like Eliza and Debbie, anyone who dares to stand in his way. Of all the villains we've mentioned so far, he takes his greed and cruelty to a whole new level, and even his one bright side as a character, that being a genuine love and respect he has for his wife, is just nowhere near enough to stop us from seeing these two as total monsters. Although, while it's great to protect animals, some animals can be pretty villainous too, as we see with Dag the Coyote from the movie Barnyard. While there's something to be said for the whole circle of life thing, that all animals have to eat, even if it means eating other animals, Dag takes what would otherwise be just a part of nature and turns it into a cruel game for him and his pack. We slaughter every animal in sight. He gets a kick out of terrorizing the barnyard's chickens and later on even goes out of his way to kidnap an innocent chick, Maddie. Again, he does this for his own amusement rather than just his need to eat as he tries to scare Maddie before attempting to eat her. Dag also purposely goes after what he sees as easy prey, making him come off as not only cruel but also lazy, given that he and his pack could just as easily go after wild animals like rabbits or even deer if they really needed to eat. But of course, what places him this low is his most infamous crime, that being the murder of Ben the Cow. Afterwards, he taunts Ben's son, Otis, What do you want to be a hero, cow? with his father's death and tries to manipulate him into letting Dag and the other coyotes take what they want. This, and the way he kills Ben, going for the leg, shows just how underhanded Dag can be, fully leaning into the stereotype of the cruel coyote. But while he may not be as scary as a sharp-toothed coyote, the goofy pie mascot version of Moriarty that we saw in Sherlock No was still able to make quite the impression. Once just a simple truck ornament, Moriarty discovered a love for destroying lawn ornaments and thus vowed to destroy every gnome in London, all for his own amusement. Through this goal, he became rivals with Sherlock gnomes and while his overall goal remained the same, his temporary defeat at the hands of the detective prompted him to create a new game of sorts. After faking his death, he and his gargoyle henchmen were able to manipulate Watson into giving them the location where all of London's guard and gnomes are being safely kept. If not for the efforts of Sherlock and the others, Moriarty would have literally murdered dozens of innocent gnomes. All just for funsies. And yeah, they may just be ceramic gnomes, but they're still alive. So it's pretty messed up. In that sense, his revenge and attempted murder regarding Sherlock gnomes is just the cherry on top of this evil pie. Now, just outside the podium of evil, we have our second Rango villain, Mayor Tortoise John. While he may start out seeming humble and even even sort of grandfatherly, John is a corrupt and selfish mayor through and through, using his control over the town's water supply to both control its citizens and to try and run them out of town. I guess power has its privileges. You make a good point, son. All in the hopes of pursuing his vision for the future. While John is far from the only corrupt leader on this list, him being the mayor of a desert town, one with children in it, mind you, makes his withholding of water come off as all the more monstrous, regardless of whether or not he thinks turning dirt into a city of the future is for the best. John is also more than willing to murder others, either through his partnership with the bounty hunter, Rattlesnake Jake, or with his own two hands. He's also cowardly, begging for 
mercy once the tables are turned on him, despite not being willing to give any mercy himself. Taking our bronze medal of evil is Dr. Robotnik from the Sonic the Hedgehog movies. Now, don't get us wrong, we absolutely love Jim Carrey's portrayal as the infamous Eggman, but he certainly takes the character to levels of evilness that we don't necessarily always see in the Sonic games. During the first movie, Dr. Robotnik puts all of his efforts into capturing the mysterious Blue Hedgehog, taking a lot of delight in getting to break out all of his gadgets and weapons during these efforts. It should be noted that he doesn't really give a damn about the property damage or the risks to innocent bystanders during his fights with Sonic. He's also more than happy to threaten the lives of Tom and later Maddie when they try to stand in his way. His evilness gets bumped up another level in the sequel, however, when we see him manipulate Knuckles and use him as a means to get him the Master Emerald. In the case of both Knuckles and Agent Stone, Robotnik further emphasizes how little he truly cares for his allies. You poor, naive creature. It's not your fault. Seeing them only as tools to use alongside his machines. He also once again tries to kill Sonic, Tom, and Maddie, and once fused with the Master Emerald, we hear him rave about how he's going to try and take over the whole universe with his new power. With at least one more Sonic movie to go and Carrie being confirmed to return, it'll be interesting to see just how much further this guy will go in terms of evilness. For our silver medal of evil, we have to give it to Jimmy Neutron's King Goobot. Keeping with the global threats of Paramount Animation, King Goobot is introduced through a mass kidnapping in which we see him abduct all the parents in Retroville. As if that weren't enough of an introduction, we later learn that Goobot wasn't just enslaving the parents of Retroville, but wanted to use them as a sacrifice for the giant chicken monster Poultra. But of course, you can't forget about just how cruel he is towards Jimmy and his friends, taunting them and crushing Jimmy's spirits when it seems like it'll be impossible to rescue everyone. Really, Goobot's whole plot is just incredibly messed up when you consider that it would have made hundreds of kids orphans if he had succeeded. And even when you exclude all his additional evil deeds from the Jimmy Neutron TV series, his actions in this one movie are still enough to land him the Silver Medal of Evil. But with that said, our Gold Medal of Evil has to go to one of the most most recent animated Paramount villains, Superfly from TMNT Mutant Mayhem. Once just an ordinary housefly before being mutated by his quote father, Superfly is the leader of a mutant gang that strives to overtake and get revenge on the human race. I decided to kill all the humans. Although he is capable of being kind to his fellow mutants, almost being a guardian of sorts for them, Superfly is more than willing to turn on his allies if they try to stand up up to him or tell him that he's wrong for going after humans. Speaking of which, he's incredibly vindictive and cold-blooded, having no problems with killing any and all humans, and any humans that he doesn't wipe out he plans on enslaving and using for his own amusement. While he may claim that he does what he does for the sake of his fellow mutants, it's made very clear that he only cares about satisfying his own need for power and revenge, especially once he starts trying to kill not only the turtles, who are young teens, but and also his fellow mutant siblings. Admittedly, when it comes to his super duper fly form, he really only gets to terrorize New York. Still, given his steadfast goals and unwillingness to compromise on them, it's safe to say that if he hadn't been defeated, Superfly could have easily killed most of, if not all, humans. And for these reasons, we feel that Superfly is Paramount's most evil animated villain so far. 